Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You know, the failure of courage and uh, of perfectionism and uh, of just being a procrastinator and avoidance person. That I, I don't want to talk about that stuff because I don't think I'm, I don't think I have it together enough to be better. I always wanted to work it out before saying something. You know? And, uh, we don't get to work, we work it out by saying something. And we say it and almost always as we share what we have to share, there's a funny kind of transformation. Before, we're obsessed with results. We're obsessed with observable change. Where we're not, where we're more efficient or more courageous or got it together, or more charming, pretty or something. And, uh, instead of the observable results being different, it's just a, a greater solidarity with other people that just gives a solace to the heart. Uh, and it's, and we don't even change sometimes. We, on the spot, we don't change the way we thought we'd change. You know, we kind of keep some hang up or um, you, you confess your hang up. You have a fear. You can't stand to go to the podium. You finally say, well, "I'll do anything. I won't go to that meeting because they have a podium, and I won't do this because I might have to stand up and say something." You say, "Ah, I got it off my chest. I was honest." You still feel that way, um, but you may be able to do it and be nervous and be afraid of it. And find out you lived. You know, uh, and then never, well, my, I have a little sister who's sober longer than I am in the fellowship. And, uh, she'll be 20 years sober next July. My little sister. Um, and she, um, she's afraid of the podium. She, with her brother being this maniac talker, she told a short version of her story for the first time, a nine-minute version when she took her sixth birthday cake. Uh, and she's honest about that thing, but she's got this thing still kind of inhibition. Um, so that, the way it goes. And the, um, to, again, just to sketch out this picture of the transformation still. Um, you know, I want to, you know, I guess, underline it's not just a matter of confessing, of finally telling them. It's sharing in the atmosphere of our fellowship and program. That's what's healing. Uh, and, uh, and again, the, the, they say, well, that'd be, yeah, it's nice. Confession's good for the soul, and, you know, be honest. I, that's kind of nice. Well, it's not just kind of nice. It's life-saving. You see, when we're living in our disease, we're in pain. And we're in pain. There's two levels of pain two that I distinguish. The deep level and the surface level. On the surface level is not trivial pain. Serious stuff on the surface. Broken bones, divorces, public humiliation, death of loved ones, fatal diseases, on and on. That You say, are you calling it the surface? Yeah, it's pain that you know where it's coming from, and it's awful, um, but there it is. Then there's pain that's kind of dull and deep, and I call that the oceanic ache. That's the pain that goes along with this illness. It's a pain that's caused by the inability to be honest. The inability to be honest in an atmosphere of acceptance and trust. The inability to speak our heart so that we can be healed, so that we can be comforted. And every human being has a deep need to say what's inside and have someone else hear it and look back at us. We need to have that done. We yearn to have that done. If we don't get to do that, we are in isolation. We're in anguish. 
because there's no there's no connection and there's no felt understanding in love. We cannot believe we're loved if the one who supposedly loves us doesn't know our story. We just they, they just love an image, you know. They they wouldn't they wouldn't love me if they knew. No, no way. That's by the way the um, the core beliefs of the addict. Read about the sexual compulsive behavior in uh, Out of the Shadows, a book by Pat- Patrick Carnes, and he talks about the core beliefs of an addict. That the inside and it works for. You guys are pretty loud outside too. Um, the like the core beliefs. He said there's four core beliefs and only one of the beliefs has to do with a particular addiction. The first is basically I'm no good. Second, if they knew the truth, they'd reject me. They'd never accept me. Third, if I have to wait around for their, for them to help me fulfill my needs, I'd wait forever. I gotta take care of things myself. Fourth, Control is my most important need. Sex is my most important need. Being sexually attractive as the co is my most important need. A drink is my most important need. A pill is. That will take care, that will give solace. We need solace. We need love. We need to be connected as children of God with one another. We just yearn for that and I've got to have it. And when it's blocked off, we are, we're at a, a, an ache I call the oceanic ache just that dull pain. And that's the kind of pain that puts us in jeopardy of drinking again, of, of acting again. With that pain, you add one of those surface pains of the death of a spouse, the, a real setback, you lose your job. And if it's combined with the oceanic ache, we're gone. No. We'll do something. We'll do something crazy. Uh, and when we get in the program, that oceanic ache begins to drain away. We still have all the troubles of life. But it begins to drain away so that once we're really working our surrender and self-acceptance and and a faith leads us to start telling the truth in this kind of way that the middle steps lead us to do, and that ache begins to drain away, then all of those surface pains in life change the way they affect us. And and we've experienced this already. If somebody dies and you have the oceanic ache, you have a drink because, God, you know, they died. Once we're in the program and that drains away, if somebody dies you love, I've got enough grief and trouble without drinking besides. it, It sharpens the motivation to be sober and increases our gratitude. And on down the line, I lost, lose your job? Well, I lost my job. I don't have as much money. And it's a cure. I'm sure not going to drink besides that and make it worse, you know. So everything is turned, you see. Once that, our heart is, has the solace it needs, you know. Um, and it's working the middle steps that does that. Working the middle steps that connects us up with God and other human beings so that we have this flow. The flow of recognition, love, understanding, acceptance. And once that's flowing and going on, we become very tough. You know, we're fragile in our own way. But we, it, it, once that's going on, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can get you drunk and nobody can get you to panic and live in control again. They just can't. Because the more pressure brought to bear once the program's in place, the more motivation to work the program. It just locks in. You know. So we uh, we begin to do this stuff, you know. Uh, so I think, it occurred to me the other day, you know, I love paradox, as you probably are noticing. Um, someone was extolling honesty, you know. So I think I might have mentioned this is the opening night here. But I, uh, you know, when we actually practice honesty, it doesn't, it's not a smooth deal, you know. Uh, 
We still have our fear affecting us. And uh, we're not so sure about this. Um, and there's a certain amount, there's a certain despair and sense of failure, even a sense of death in being honest. Because as we get honest, the old self dies. The old image bites the dust. You can't keep up the old front when you're talking against the old front. You know, start, uh, uh, oh my gosh. But it makes us feel disoriented, you know. Uh, what will I do with my, I get, get the new image, you know. And as we uh, try it out and tell the truth, of course we, um, uh, we've, so the instant it, the connection's made, oh, then the anguish is over about losing our image and that kind of thing. The other thing about the, the way the, you know, the fourth and fifth step is constructed, um, it'll sound, when we still <clears throat> have some fear affecting the way we read and understand, and we read the, uh, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, admitted to God, ourselves, and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs, Okay, if you hear it in that tone of voice, it seems like this is going to be kind of a guilty kind of trip here, and it see and there's a there's a kind of the vibrations of blame going on there. We're going to have to write down everything that's our fault. What's your fault? What do you deserve blame for? And if you Start doing an inventory with the attitude that I've got to write down the things I deserve blame for. And sometimes it'll stop you in your track. It's very depressing to write down things you deserve blame for. And then you could, because we're, when, it, when we're in fear, that's a fear word, blame. And when we're in fear, we do one of two things with stuff that could be in our inventory. We either justify ourselves, make a case, make a little defense attorney before God. Well, it wasn't really so bad. I mean, if, you had a, if your parents were like my parents, you probably would have done worse. Uh, it is a free country. I mean, it's not against the law, after all. Free consenting adults. Um, <laughs> this, uh, we'll make a case, okay. And then if we're not making a case for ourselves when we're in fear, we will go over to the other side and and just have utter contempt for ourselves. Just say, you low life, you are just disgusting. I mean, not only are you immoral, you're immoral in bad taste. Um, you know, there's no, uh, no hope for you. you know? And you know, you know, but you go into a self-disgust thing. That at it, all of that stuff is the way is an attitude of fear. And when we take the, when we start doing our inventory and writing down resentment, we're not. When we write down a resentment, we're not writing down stuff we deserve blame for. There's no one around blaming us. We write down stuff that we need healing for, that we need liberation about. We write down stuff where it hurts, where we have hurt them and we have hurt ourselves by hurting, and where we need some healing. Nobody's after us. And we have a higher power who loves us and treasures us. And when we have contempt for ourselves, that interferes with our relationship with God because it's not in harmony with our higher power's attitude. Higher power has compassion and acceptance in the same way any decent member of the fellowship has when you're talking to him. If you're pouring out what's inside of you, you don't have to be the world champion Avalon or AA member. All they have to be is just a regular attending the meetings person. You know? And uh, was full of their own fears and freak out feelings and so forth. And uh, if you start telling them what's on your mind, they're vastly relieved. You're not as good as they thought. 
because now they're probably going to be able to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> they receive you with, there's no, you did what? You know, this, uh, well, you know, has anyone ever in a participation meeting, someone got up and talked about uh, abandoning their family in the Midwest and fleeing out here? Say, well, you know, there's consequences of that. I'm afraid we'll have to whip you. <laughs> mm -hmm. have to, uh, every member of the group gets five lashes <laughs> to, to, pay, to pay the price. You know, that's not our business. That's not, it's, on the other hand, the group doesn't pat somebody on the head and say, oh, poor baby, they probably were too demanding on you anyway. Uh, glad you can. No, there's a, there's a respect for a person. It looks like you got some, some amends to make and some healing to, to go through, and we're going to stand by you while you do what's got to be done for healing. And once, you see, at that attitude, there's no reason to be defensive and make excuses, and there's no reason to despise yourself. Either one. Fear is the whole foundation of excuses and self-contempt. And when, once we get into the spirit of the program, it's putting down what we, what we have to say because we need healing there. And when we, what we take responsibility, you know, when it's, uh, uh, when somebody hurt us, you know, the big book says, we don't dwell on the other person's, uh, inventory, what they've done wrong. If people have done wrong to you, there's never any reason to pretend they didn't. The other person and judge them with rejecting judgment, which doesn't hurt anybody, which doesn't help anybody. But to acknowledge, that's a lot of the healing in ACA, is, is to get it straight. Uh, what happened and, and how I had a need to pretend I wasn't hurt in, in order to survive at the time. We get that straightened out. But we, if we're working the program and the steps, we'll keep moving ahead. And as we acknowledge that, we acknowledge our part. And you say, what do you mean our part? When you're a little kid, um, you know, you're going to blame yourself for being negative after they beat you up. You're going to blame yourself for being an iceberg and, and distant after you were sexually abused. You know, why do that? It's their fault. Fear. That's fear talking. There's no healing going on there. I have a little list of things that, um, you see, the, the thing is, when we write down our inventory, our part in the transaction, we're not writing down what we deserve blame for. There's no deserve blame left. There's only a searching for healing and integral that we cannot be healed unless we take responsibility for our lives. We own our own feelings and own what we do and kind of stand up with the, with the trust that we're accepted in this group by God and other people. And people will help us walk through and get free of the ways we handle things. For example, it can be something that isn't a sin or at all. If you, if, well, you're abused. You, you were the one they hurt. What did you put in your inventory? Well, acknowledge you've been hurt as best you can. But it's straight. But then acknowledging your own part. We might say, I acknowledge that I burdened others with the obligation of making me happy. <laughs> I just uh, decided that they had to treat me right, or I would never be happy, and it's their fault. Um, nobody can make us happy. One of the ways we can tell we've so assign someone else the job of making us happy is when we're very deeply disappointed or resentful of the other person. We're holding it against them. God damn it. Um, we're, we're, that person hurts you. That isn't funny. But you acknowledge your hurt and reach, okay, what does a person do after they're hurt that way? Well, they have to acknowledge it. Maybe they have to even tell the person. But we don't have to get them to apologize or change. 
and we don't have to roll back history and have it not happen. The program says we nobody can stop you from working your program and having a life. Nobody. And we don't have to have rejecting judgment on anyone else, and we're not in the business of getting blameworthy stuff for ourselves. But to say, uh, yeah, I... Uh, I'll combine this, this too. I kind of made a distinction. Maybe they can emerge. But the number two was we acknowledge that we mess back when they mess with us. <laughs> uh, you say, well, why should I even mention that? That's so little, you know. I mean, the way I was treated, probably blame anybody for being distant and negative. Nobody's blaming. But if you are distant and negative, as a way of coping and avoiding hurt, you have hurt yourself a lot. And you're in the habit of hurting yourself a lot. And if you can say that's what you're doing, you're one step closer to being free, set free from that behavior. It's nothing to do with blaming you. That's the way an inventory heals. Also good to acknowledge resentments we have uh, against God. <laughs> I, I resent, I found out that I resented God for two reasons. I resented Him for not making me turn out better. And I resented Him for not giving me a bigger payoff for my compliance. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I went to the seminary early and I was a good boy. Now. You know? Make me good and make me, you know, it's a reward. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a self-centered kind of attitude. Um, nobody's blaming me and putting me down for being kind of mad at God for not making me turn out better. That's what happens if you get the, get a basic misunderstanding about what the deal is <laughs> with God, you know. I thought the deal was. You know, so that I'd get over everything and finally be all right and have everybody look up to me forever. Um, you can see how this is a, it's the very heart of this is transformation. Um, the woman, um, very touching to me, this uh, story of a gal who uh, heard this in a pitch, 10 minute pitch. She gave it a convention. I don't remember the long pitch at all, but her, her sharing really knocked me out. Uh, and in this very brief sharing, she, she talked about uh, getting sober, and then once she got a little stabilized and started getting the program, talking to a sponsor, she talked about her the way she resented her father. She said, my father was so bad. He, he was so cruel and he abused me so much that no way, I mean... Me, drop, he's as fast as you. And the sponsor said, ask God to help you let it go. And she wouldn't even cooperate with that for a little while. And finally, with the, the, the negative feelings, she thought, well, okay, I'll give it a shot. So she said, okay, I'll let go of the resentment. And it didn't go. Stuck. Then she um, said, well, I guess you're going to have to pray for him. Pray for him? So the big book suggests we pray for somebody. So she prayed for him. The resentment stayed. Pray for him as you would a sick friend. Prayed, still resented him. The sponsor said, okay, after a few more months of that, you'll have to escalate this to the next stage. Now, what is that? You're going to have to treat him decently. No, no, not that. Uh... <laughs> He lived in the same town still. And he was in contact with the family. And she'd see him once in a while. Couldn't avoid it. She saw everybody else. She says, you don't have to pretend you like him. You don't have to just treat him decently. Don't put out negative stuff. If you find it very difficult, but at least be civil and do things decent to him. She'd already done her foot. I think she said to him that, you know, she was hurt. And they didn't work. You know, I mean, he didn't respond very well. 
Okay, so she went on the, okay, under the heading of treating him decently meant sending him a birthday card, Christmas card, and saying hello when she met him. So she did that for about four years and felt a resentment. He finally got sick and went to the hospital for some surgery or other, and he was in the hospital and she thought, well, under the heading of treating him decently, I guess that means I have to go by with a card or a flower or something. And so she went by and did her duty, walked in, put the thing down, said hello, hope it get better, without much feeling, and went down and she said she was getting into her car and realized the resentment was gone. She was in touch with his humanity at last and was no longer under the oppression of his own illness. Her father was sick and couldn't love and lashed out in ways were, that were awful. But she was set free from his illness by working this program. It's not that we let people off the hook and mollify and say, oh, it wasn't so bad. Nothing to do with that. It's cooperating with God to set us free from other people's emotional domination of our lives by keeping us negative. You see how different this is? This is prayerful. This is honest. This requires an atmosphere in which we are given assurance that we're not blamed and rejected. And that it's not, it isn't even to our interest to find out we're innocent. You know? You don't get any points for being innocent. You don't get any points for saving God the trouble of healing you. You don't get any, it's just a matter of getting to the truth. Getting to what in us is causing us to snuff out life. What in us is, is walling me off from being in touch with the humanity of somebody. What in me is preventing me, what in, it, what in me and my attitude and things I'm, memories and the things I'm holding, makes me still vulnerable to the cruelty of another person who lives far away. For I'm still churning about them. And the the big book says, we have a program that will give you healing from that. And it doesn't come at our time and just the way we want to. Sometimes it'll be five years, even while we're applying ourselves steadily. But you know that person, that, that woman who did that thing with her father, if she did that for five years, she's working a hell of a program. You know? And she was still bedeviled by that, and it was still kind of a pain. But still there was a, she was going in, in the direction. You know? And the whole thing is not the result, but that we go in the right direction. Um, again, the, uh, so sex relationships are, uh, you know, a good field for, just mentioning how the transformation is the big thing, the transformation of attitude from defensiveness, fear, and self-contempt you know, over to faith. Um, because when we're, uh, say, do the, the sex inventory or relationship inventory, where there's... Uh, you know, the things we look at, I, I find that... Uh, being a Catholic and being a professional Catholic, <laughs> I uh, I studied morality rather closely. I got down to every. I probably know the names of more sins than you do. Um, <laughs> and um, I know I know all kinds of ways of sin. Um, <laughs> and the. The big book, when it does the, um, does, gives a couple pages of commentary on making an inventory in our lives in the sex area, it says we treat sex as we would any other issue, any other problem. And we treat relationships that are sexual in nature kind of the way we treat other relationships. In other words, what we ask is, how have I hurt others or hurt myself? Rather than, what gradation of sin did I commit and how much danger am I in? You know, 
which can be the, you know, the, the, the self-centered, pious person's thing of getting obsessed with my standing and how guilty I am or not, which is a, a very unloving thing, you know, a very inconsiderate thing. And the big book's a good guide for that. The, um, uh, just a few comments on different, uh, aspects of, um, relationship. One, a marriage relationship, um, You know, the most god-awful surrender is necessary for two people to be able to stand each other in close quarters. Um, uh, the, um, you know, I'll never forget the talking to several couples in a row on a couple's retreat. The first retreat I ever did, and, and I, it's an annual thing, and a lot of the couples keep coming back, and, and these are not young couples. Um, they are not couples with unstable marriages. Uh, they started out with a doctor and his wife, and there was a bunch of other doctors, the seven doctors and their wives, and psychologists. And then over the years, they were added and changed, but there were a few of the originals. One year, I was third, third or fourth year in doing this, several couples came in to talk to me, and they were married in an average of 35 years. And we're, we're talking about divorce or separation. That wasn't the issue. They had some, something in their relationship they wanted to discuss. And that was, well, they were stable. You know? They were sober, long-term members of the program. And after I talked to three couples in a row of uh, long-term successful marriages, I was in awe at the depth of pain in a happy marriage. <laughs> <laughs> That the, and the <laughs> Jean Vanier, a spiritual writer that I I admire a lot. He's he's living. He's a French Frenchman who started all this chain of resonances for developmentally disabled people. Very spiritual guy, and he wrote a thing with, on on sex and marriage. And one of his things comments about marriage. He says. The, the mo, the special mode of married love is forgiveness. Doesn't mean you do a bad program and let someone walk all over you, be a doormat. No, no. It's just continuous forgiveness is necessary to keep the ship afloat. Um, you know, I think a happy marriage is one in which the couple, the husband and wife love each other, are glad they're married to each other, but really miss each other if they were separated. And can barely stand each other. Uh, uh, in the, there's just, there's just something about a person who refuses to get out of your face. You know, they won't go home. Uh, <laughs> it's because they are home. <laughs> and the, the surrender of letting another person be, and it, uh, I think that surrender can be expressed in the mode of forgiveness a lot. Forgiving them just for being there. Forgiving them for, uh, forgiving them for the, the way they won't wise up ever. You know, forgive us, forgive us. You can say anything you want, be honest, but there's an element of, of a decision. You know? We kind of have the, we have a choice of whether or not to forgive the person's presence. And, uh, and you forgive their presence and forgive this and forgive that. And you can be honest. Say anything you want. Make your complaint. And turn over the results of the complaint. And, of course, the thing I mentioned earlier what happens when we do totally forgive and turn over, and that is the goodness of that person becomes available to us again. Uh, and there can be some fun, you know. Uh, but that, and so in an in a inventory, uh, there can be, especially from the al point of view, it's very difficult. I think it's out, much harder for an al to take an inventory, even though we alcoholics can't remember half of what we did. Um, <laughs> it's hard because there's so much injury done unto a person who comes to al as such horrendous inconsideration, you know, and, and, and sensitive, boorish, overbearing betrayals and everything. And I'm, I'm getting into it, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> and they, um, and they, of course, it it takes you know getting into the program, you know, to make the distinction between not being a doormat and standing up for yourself, and while standing up for oneself and being honest to forgive. That's a distinction we can make well only when we're surrounded by people working the program. We need a lot of support to kind of understand. And so when we put in our inventory, um, well, I didn't forgive a lot. I, you know, and again, we say, I didn't forgive this person that was hurting me. That's not my fault. No one says it's your fault. No one's blaming you. But if you get into the habit of being having hardness of heart and protecting yourself by being tough in that manner, well, then you just get a little too tough. A little too tough for your own good. And you just get so tough that there's no comfort can get through the defense to, to, to touch your heart and uh, be of solace. Uh, so we, we write down didn't harden, held things against him and was, was cold and distant. That doesn't mean you're taking the blame because there's no blame. Um, it's funny, you know, when the boyfriend, girlfriend, or boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, uh, relationship, uh, what, an aspect of the courting or the going out with somebody that kind of tickles me. It's funny, but it's tragic. Is, um, there seems to be social permission to lie and deceive and manipulate anybody that you have a chance of having a sexual relationship with. And you're supposed to be honest and considerate and respectful of everybody else. But if there's a chance, you're kind of allowed to lie in order to make a good impression. So it'll work. You know, do we? There's something about the social permission, and I think that uh, uh, has to be kind of looked at. The um, <laughs> and I think um, you know, in relationships that are that have some social stigma connected. Um, there's a, there's a mild stigma, I guess, connected with living one another without being married. Stigma connected with some, with gay relationships. And whenever there's a little bit of a social stigma, it adds a lot to defensiveness. There's a thing, well, it's not wrong. Well, if someone is accusing us, then we, we tend to get defensive. And one thing about the, the whole, the program, 12 steps, leads us always to a point where we don't have to be defensive. Where we can honestly just, God, please help me see what I'm really up to and really doing and what my intentions are and let me know if, I, how, if I'm hurting myself or others. Because nobody's really blaming us. And so I think when it comes to a relationship, say long-term relationships that are irregular in some way, uh, by society standards, there's still, in our inventory, we look, what's the bottom line here? Uh, not what do they say, how am I experiencing this? What do I say? What's my own conscience? Um, uh, and I think a guide to examining a relationship that's sexual is to take out the sex and say, how do you treat the person as a person if you re disregard the sex altogether? And that tells us how we're treating a person as a person. Are we, there's a necessity of radical surrender, of being willing for a person to either love us or not love us, or make a decision to go where they want to go or not, where you are honest about what you'd like, but you have to let the person grant them their freedom. Or we manipulate and don't treat a person right. It's, it's not good manners. <laughs> it backfires. Um, the uh, transformation that the program offers us is especially apparent in uh, behavior that uh, we would kind of all, that 
most people agree is, ooh, pretty destructive. Uh, behavior that's in the sexual area that, I would say, very promiscuous behavior where there's a lot of sex that's really impersonal, practically, or, um, um, so it's the kind of behavior that goes along with drinking a lot, you know. And we can say, if there's fear, there's either a bunch of excuses or utter shame and contempt. And if there's faith, there's the attitude that, you know, if you have sex with a lot of different people and you're not ready, you sure have to lie a lot. And there's something about sex where you know, there's a God-givenness to the whole operation where it seems there's a sort of a built-in message. And uh, two people can be agreed that they're not, this is no big deal, this isn't the answer, we're not going to be a couple. But just uh, after a bunch of dinner, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, and there may be an agreement that there's no but there's a certain like nature a, there's a certain given about the message of sexual intercourse and the given is just it is a symbolic way of saying we're in this together. And I care about your whole life, but I kind of care where your laundry is done and what your plans are and how your taxes are doing. And uh, it implicitly says that. You didn't realize that, but it implicitly... <laughs> and when the, end, the endocrine system gets secreting certain uh, little chemical messages, they go out to the body, and the whole body gets ready to have some security and have some place to rest your head where they don't move fast and drop it. <laughs> there's a... And whether there's... It doesn't matter whether anybody means this or not. The whole system gets ready for some kind of intimacy and love and tenderness, and, uh, and then when it doesn't happen... It's like getting your chin dropped on cement. And so it's tough. And if a person looks at their own life, say, with insufficient preparation or, or whatever wasn't personal enough and says, you know, uh, there was some damage to me and other people, and I want to acknowledge that. But no defensiveness, no contempt for oneself. So you're in a faith that can be that way, and then we can talk in a way that's healing and not just circular, you know. Um, we started a little late, and I went a little late. Um, I should stop. Uh, usually, I stop just before I say anything about sex. And get, um, <laughs> but I have—I didn't get to the perversion. I had a, the whole page on the whole page on perversions, but I don't. <laughs> Come back next time. And it, <laughs> let's pray. Let's see. We pray the Lord's Prayer, then we have the, the meeting is scheduled at 9. I don't know. I only Do we have a meeting? <laughs> 8.45. Let's say 9 o'clock. Let's say 9. Let's stand and pray the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> this is the end of Session 4 and the start of Session 5. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. My original plan this morning was to share, uh, have a reflection on the 11th step, which I'm still going to do, and then lead into a meditation that would be a silent meditation, basically, where everybody would go out in the sunshine and... Uh, <laughs> And walk around, uh, and so I think we're a little bit cooped up here, so we'll probably have a guided meditation for a little while right where we're sitting. It's pretty high. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, I got it. We'll have to get a microphone here next year or something. Um, okay, the 11th step. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. As we understand Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Uh, this is the, the this is the step where we uh, cooperate with our higher power to energize, let grow the spiritual awakening he's bringing about within us. The thing about prayer is not that we need to remind God of anything or kind of get him on our side or give him instructions or uh, show how good we are. It's nothing to... It, you know, and this is not something like you know, some modern reflection as if I am saying dun, 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 the 20th century, we know now uh, that we... We're not the one that cajole God into doing things. Uh, this is standard spiritual wisdom. Uh, St. Augustine in the 5th century had long essays on how our prayers aren't meant to change God at all. Our prayers simply change us so that our hearts are more open to the action. Um, the God's favor, God's love, His, His way is on. His love is out there. Healing and forgiveness, and uh, that's flowing like a river. That's going on. The, the only variable in the whole thing is, is what's inside of us. The only variable is um, how, whether I can catch it or not. Uh, and if I'm drinking and distracted, I'm, and what I was just calling it, uh, when I have a lot of I gotta's, I gotta have this, I gotta have this, gotta, um, when I got the gotta's, I am single-mindedly paying attention to what I, what I figure I need in the way and when I need it, and I simply miss what my higher power has in mind. It just kind of sails by. Could have got it, but I'm not paying attention to that. But I got my hands full. Um, and in our desperation for, for survival, we kind of do that. Um, and after we begin to have a spiritual awakening and we're drawn into the fellowship, and we kind of get wised up a bit, and we have our heart healed a bit, and we have some people who start to know us as we are, and we start to have some exchange, and it's this wonderful relief where you don't have to put up a, for any pretense we put it up anyway, just just in case. Uh, but we can devote less energy to the pretense. Um, and we uh, start letting the spiritual touch, the awakening, have a big effect in our life and guide us. Well, even then, we're in a world with a lot of com competing voices. Uh, I started out the retreat by talking about how recovery itself can take the shine off of our spiritual awakening by distracting us into the, all of the advance and the job we're doing and comparing how well I'm doing. Um, and it goes on and on. Uh, there is at the risk of um, making this tape unable to be sent through the mails. Um, <laughs> I think that this is just, you know, like for educational purposes only. I have to use this this word in order to get across the kind of distraction which I think is one of the biggest obstacles to letting our spiritual awakening continue to nourish and guide us. Um, and it, the way this was described is unforgettable to me. The guy, I go to a, my home, main home meeting is the White Flag Men's Stack, downtown Los Angeles. One of the guys came in one night and he was, he just saying, oh, I've been listening to K-Fuck all day. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry if that, that's what he said and it, 
everybody knew what he meant. You know? Everybody knew that there's that there's a running commentary of self-obsessed fear in the back of our heads. Just this running commentary on how bad everyone else is doing and how unfair life is and how things we probably she's leaving. Um, <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> And the, there's great competition for computer time, you might call it. There's a great competition. Who gets on the screen? There's lots of people waiting in line to get on your screen. Uh, Self-obsessed fear, regular talk radio, uh, the kids, all kind of competing influences and so forth. And they all want their are waiting their turn to get on the screen. Maybe two or three at once are on the screen. So you're kind of looking uh, like this. And uh, prayer has to do with deliberately tuning in to your own spiritual awakening, tuning in to your higher power, and the basis of our own experience of a higher power, so that we're not swept away by listening to that radio station, where it just fills our life with negativity uh, and, and a thing that drains us instead of nourishes us. And as we, well, how do you do that? How do you tune in? Well, we, you know, I, we start to meditate. We listen to God. Well, how do you listen to God? I want to suggest that everybody here has a lot of experience and we're fairly practiced at listening to God. Uh, anybody who's been to meetings on any kind of a regular basis has gotten used to a certain uh, spiritual discipline, a routine. And I call it kind of an active meditation. And when we do that, we, we're simply at a meeting, and somebody starts to share their experience, strength, and hope. And as they're telling their story or going through what they're going to go through, um, and it, you know, at a, at a significant percentage of the time, somebody who is experience, sharing their experience, strength, and hope, is doing so in a way that we can relate to. And they're doing so in a way where they, they talk about their life and what happened in terms of the spiritual awakening they had. Now, may they, they may not mention the word God, and they may not mention the word spiritual awakening at all. Probably won't. Uh, but they'll simply tell their story. And in the story, if there's a turn in their life where it was from struggling and being negative and despair and total frustration into finding a big relief where they were drawn into this pathway where instead of try and try and try and fighting yourself, there was a, a turn and a peacefulness where we're just going to relax and someone holds your hand while you get used to being a ding bad algae. And then they give you some suggestions on footwork that makes you more peaceful with that um, and then give you suggestions that uh, increase the quality of our spiritual hygiene. You know, instead of constantly hiding, we actually can connect with another person. Instead of being so drained and and taken up with our self-obsession, we're drawn out of ourselves to pay attention to somebody else and then find the relief and the, the freshening up and the relaxation that comes from being let off the hook where I can actually pay attention to another human being. Uh, and instead, all those things that start to happen, and then the, uh, the discovery that we're, we're sober and we don't mind it. I'm sober and I don't feel like I'm doing some big heroic thing. I feel like I'm just fortunate that I get, that I get to be clean and sober. I don't have to go through all that exhausting, draining, isolating, ah, uh, Oh, thank you, God. That's a spiritual awakening, by the way, if you don't even think of God directly, but it's rather indirect. And if you're listening to somebody's pitch, and be it A.A. or al on and somebody starts talking about the the surprising liberation of doing it, do a little workout of release with love. Okay, I release you. I heard one uh, al woman one time and it was suggested to her that she give her husband permission to drink. 
and it was meant, you know, inside. Let go, don't resist the thing. But she walked in and says, I give you permission to drink. You know? uh, and he said, you know, uh, but, uh, but it was part of her spiritual awakening. She did it. It confused him to no end. He didn't know what was going on for a while. Uh, but when we listen to these, to the stories of our brothers and sisters, and in the middle of the story you say, oh yeah, uh huh, yeah, you're meditating. You're listening to God. Now wait a minute, that person isn't God there. This is what I mean. When we identify with the spiritual awakening of another, with someone else's spiritual awakening, and I listen to it, and it rings my bell, if it resonates with the experience I've had, then the experience I've had comes to life. It's, it's raised up on my screen. It has the, the center. And as, when it's raised up on my screen, it becomes a more vital thing within me. And then I relate that past event to today. And it has an effect of giving more hope for today and more encouragement to live in the spirit of that past experience. In other words, I'm listening to God. I'm listening to the voice of God that hit me already and that then speaks to me afresh about today and I get encouragement and direction. See, you're all good at it already. You're all good at meditation. And when we meditate, we do something like that all the time. We, you use a 24 hour a day book, you use uh, another book, uh, and uh, what you're doing is reading something that's a reflection or a report or a reflection on or the result of a spiritual experience of somebody. And if you uh, read the report of someone else's spiritual experience, and if it rings your bell, if you identify it all, there's that, that thing happens. And as the thing happens, you know, it becomes available to me, and that process goes on, and we listen to God. We can do that in a meeting. We can do that out of a little book. We can do that uh, there are many forms of doing it. One of the, um, a form of meditation that we usually associate with Eastern religion, Buddhism, or, uh, more of a transcendental meditation, is emptying out. Um, by the way, that form of meditation was much more, was very common among Christians before the printing press. Since the printing press, we got so much paper. We're reading all the time. And we won't shut up. We, we, if we shut up, we'll read. We won't just quiet down and just be in the presence of our higher power uh, with less activity. And so it's that, that tradition was kind of long. Uh, at least it was thinned out. You know? um, and I think there are some mantras. I, I use this, a couple of, I consider them more Al-Anon mantras. Uh, they seem to have the best ones. Uh, so many. It was, but release, release with love or release. Uh, let go. These are my two favorite ones. And all by themselves, they wouldn't mean anything to somebody, you know? Release or let go. But if you've been in the program for a while, then we've had 10,000 hours of conversation and reflection <laughs> on the whole way of life that involves releasing and letting go. Um, to simply say in a meditation with no book or anything else, just to, to sit there and say, release. And then when your own, when your radio station is coming in, just say, release. Release. What you're saying is, I want to be quiet in the presence of my higher power. Release. I want to be present in the, in the presence of the spiritual awakening my higher power has been giving me that isn't, I don't have access to it all the time a lot and I'm so full of today's stuff and, and my own fears and, and all of this that I, I need my higher power to kind of barge into me and I, 
I want to cooperate with this empty, giving a little landing space. You know, just quiet down and give a landing space. And it takes a lot of trust to do that. It means you believe in God if you do that. Because if it doesn't make any sense to make an empty space and there's nothing to come in. Um, just release. Or, like a, or you make up your own one. You know, something that suggests the whole program to you. Or suggests some special understanding you have. Uh, and just be quiet. But this, you know, if we don't have time, if we don't take time to to just give our spiritual awakening a chance to come up on the screen. Well, you know what happens to people who don't go to meetings and don't pray? They get very preoccupied uh, with things. And it's a matter. And if and if we think of this in terms of fear, the the usual way we think in terms of things, of being a little bad girl or a good girl, that's fear. Of being a good girl who prays and meditates, very good. Or bad, never doing that. And then so you get a little star if you pray, and you get a black mark if you don't pray. When we think of those terms, prayer will always be a chore and a sign of being under the thumb and oppressed by rules. You found that thoroughgoing self-acceptance of yourself as both a child of God who is beloved and as a dingbat alki or a demented al who is full of fear and anxiety and all of this wrapped together um, that you you live in a way of life where you don't have to subtract the one or the other. You don't have to subtract and hide our pain and our weakness and therefore put on a false front and we don't have to subtract the fact that we're children of God and live in shame and self-contempt. We put them both together and we know that's the way it really is. That's the way it really is. And when we meet each other like that and each person we meet, we see a child of God who is pretty goofy and who needs a lot of support or they'll freak out and pretend they're not goofy or pretend they're not a child of God, one or the other. Uh... That we need to keep looking at them, convinced both that they're both, and I got to have people looking at me, convinced that I'm both, so that and when we're convinced we're both, we feel sane. We feel, and meditation has everything to do with nourishing that, uh, letting the the best we've experienced have this maximum effect in our life. Now, that's, I just said that from a self-centered point of view, haven't I? I described the benefit of prayer to us. And, and prayer will get broader than that. It's just something that we do because it's true. You know, whether you're going to feel better or not right away, well, too bad, who cares? Um, you know, it's, it's important to be in on what, what's true is that I'm not God. What's true is that the well of love and wisdom doesn't come out of me. It is within me when I'm humbly ready to acknowledge my higher power. Uh, and it kind of rises as a God within. But I don't own it. I don't own it, possess it, and I don't control it. I'm a servant. And as we, it's just very fitting for us to, to spend a little time, uh, in the presence of the truth. And just to do it. Just so that we're not swept away with, um, with the lies that, well, with what turns out to be a lie, if that's all we hear. Uh, it's not a lie. That you're cute. It is a lie that hearing you're cute all the time is going to do it for you. <laughs> it's uh, 
get things in perspective. Um, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. That again, we get the old fear versus faith here. Uh, and I have fear in me all the time. Sometime when I'm fortunate, the fear is going to scrunch up to the side and doesn't have too much of an effect. Uh, but it's always there. Uh, it would, but when my fear has some place in me, and when I'm reading, by the way, let me take another diversion here. I, I find, and I've only been able to acknowledge this kind of recently, that the area where old ideas come in to me most strongly is when I think of spiritual things. Go into a church, start to pray, and you feel more like the old days than any other activity you do. And so it's dangerous. <laughs> we can get into start praying, saying, okay, time to pray, and immediately fall into guilt. Because uh, you haven't prayed enough, you haven't prayed well enough, who do you think you are? And that's kind of spiritual K, you know what. Um, it isn't the truth. That we, if we can fall into this, uh, it's old ideas. It's, it's the kind of thought process and the little pathways that we've taken a lot when we're thinking in spiritual terms and spiritual words in our life. I think it's good to, to acknowledge that, if, if this is true for you. And to say, just because it will be kind of an automatic association with a lot of our old ideas, doesn't mean that, oh, well, I guess it's just too dangerous for me to pray. I'll think of something else. Maybe high fiber and uh, uh, mega vitamins. Um, no, the Prayer has to do with not, you know, it's not designed to get in touch with all our neuroses and old ideas. The whole thing is designed to get in touch with our spiritual awakening that has begun to save our lives, change our lives. And the more we pray and the more we aim it and, and focus on our awakening, instead of the old days, uh, the healthier our prayer becomes and the more nourishing. But the, uh, as I look at this thing, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out, what I see, well, that, that'll hit my fear, see? Knowledge of God's will. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, and that's, I'll think, well, the fun is over. You know God's will. That means, you know, pain. Do you imagine God designing coffee breaks into the uh, into life? Uh, we usually don't think of that, um, and we're pretty sure He'd rather you not have sex again. Uh, if you're a particular kind of neurotic Catholic or Baptist. Um, And it, if, if it hits us in that fear that if God's will rings the bell in, in you that says deprivation, you're going to miss it. All you're going to get now is God's will, so you're probably going to miss out a lot. You know? And if, if that's the thing, say, oh, that's my fear reacting. That's my fear resonating with what I'm discovering he is always for my my new understanding of a higher power from the dumb old God I've got to drag along and give instructions to to the higher power who leads me and who's uh, giving me surprises. Uh, and it's uh, we have experience, all of us here, the way God's will is not just something that feels pretty good of us to be willing just to do God's will. You know, come on. Um, God's will is what's rescuing us from our will. Uh, you know, I had my I had my will long enough. I had a good chance, fair chance, to work it out uh, my way. And then, and then when I 
was dropping to the earth. Uh, it's about dead. I sort of be dragged along in the gospel a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, my will consisted uh, of, you know, pandering to my ego. And because I have a good education, I pander to my ego in a rather sophisticated way. Uh, I didn't want this gross uh, fulfillment. Uh, I was after a rather high level of psychological integration and adjustment. Um, and uh, I wanted to... Uh, I was after that. Uh, and I wanted to achieve it, and then maybe I'd be happy. Uh, and of course, you know, and I wanted to be good. I wanted to be a good Christian and a good priest. And uh, the way I was going to be able to tell I was a good Christian and a good priest is when I noticed that I was a little better than the other one. Built-in comparison thing. Built-in. And what does that mean when I start comparing? It means that I want to be good. I want to be good. I want to rate high on the scale so that they'll admire me. And God will think you're pretty good. And then I'll be all right. And if achieve all rightness by a high rating. You know? And this is fear and ego. It's not the spirit. Uh, the spiritual life is uh, exactly what everyone here has experienced when you found yourself early in your recovery in an informal talk with some people or in a meeting where you were acutely aware of your disease and of your comical list of fears and self-obsession uh, and that you're being held up and sanity and willingness just to show up by the sheer grace of God and working through other people. Um, and that you knew, and that people could tell that. They could look at you and see you didn't rate very well. And that you knew not rating very well didn't matter at all. I know one of the uh, things I, I can remember the feeling early when I was going to meetings and just first hitting that identification. And I was sober for a month and a half or something. And people would be sober 10 years, 15 years. And um, and I knew, because I was being touched by the program, my month and a half being sober, I didn't feel the least bit underdog-like. Or I thought, that's what I am, a month and a half. You're 10 years? Great. Uh, because we were receiving God's gifts and it just wasn't a matter of comparison. That's not what was going on. What was going on was gratitude for the gift of life, the sobriety. And once that's going on, that's the spiritual, that's the spiritual thing. And when we're say, into that, uh, we know that we have been drawn away from our usual way of thinking into another whole way of looking at things. And so that then it's God's will. God's, I'm giving an example of getting God's will when we weren't even after it. We're drawn into uh, a way of getting better and a way of life that we weren't even asking for, that we weren't alert or healthy enough to imagine. And it is a sheer gift that we're drawn that way. Or we might have even read about it and idealized about it. A lot of times we get these high ideals but the ideals are so interwoven with our own fears and insecurities and ego that we want to get them. We want to be very generous and loving and self-giving and be recognized by all as doing that, or uh, or you know something. You know, just all mixed up with everything. Then when we're given this thing, aha! Uh -huh, I just got. I just was drawn into God's will, and all I'm asked is to sign my name to it. I, I couldn't think it up. I could, and it, whenever we find ourselves living God's will, it's a liberation. It's always, oh, it's what I would have wanted if I knew enough. I would have wanted this. I would have asked uh, if I knew. 
if I wasn't so preoccupied or scared or anything. And that's God's will. God's will for us. And I want to say God's will for us because I am so much of an individualist. I am so detached and sick that I think of well-being in terms of what's good for me. And once we're on this path of recovery, we we, start, we go through a shift. You know? And we don't think this what's good for me. It's what's good for us. It's what's good for me is when I am relating well with us. Uh, what's good for me is to be identifying with you and having your life and what's going on with you important to me. And yet, have clear boundaries where we don't merge and, and we know that I don't do your chores for you or yours for me, uh, that we respect each other's dignity and individual ness, um, but that I identify with you and that I can't even begin to live my life in a healthy way and take care of myself unless I know we're linked together in fellowship. Uh, that's God's will. So God's praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry it out is not heroic. It isn't ever a matter of being, okay, I'll volunteer. God's will. Uh, you guys keep having your fun and everything. I'm going to go for God's will. and Be the scouting party that goes out and lives on weeds and uh, uh, <laughs> God's will is always what is you know, best is our true well-being if there's anything to the thing that God loves us he treasures our true well-being because that's what love is love is treasuring the well-being of the other uh, and he treasures our well-being and he draws us into that we ask you know, is that, can we um, can you pray for particular things? Should you just always say, God's will be done, and I can't pray uh, that my mother get over cancer or something? Pray for a chocolate colored course, you know. Uh, pray for anything you like. And then say, Thy will be done. Pray for anything you like and then say, have it your way. Have it what's best for us. I hang on to not, no results. Thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. Keep wising me up, please. Uh, and I have this, I have a feeling this prayer is going to be kind of dumb, higher power. And I think maybe there's a little ego and selfishness here. But I would like a little upgrade on my hi-fi system. Um, I know the $3,000 will probably feed a lot of people in Ethiopia, but... Uh, uh, I, I'm going to try not to think about that between now and the time uh, I go to the store. Uh, and if you put some obstacle in my way to stop me, well, I will be done. Um, we can... I don't know what I'm doing this for. Um, thy will be done. We we just need uh, we need to be rescued by God's will. Uh, a few things you know, people ask: How can I tell what God's will is? Well, the whole program, this, the whole way of life we have, is designed to give us some chance of recognizing what God's will is. Um, uh, one thing when the word phrase God's will comes up. It's uh, a couple of things I want to say. One is, I think it's always God's will that I take care of what's in front of me. That I simply play the hand that's dealt to me right now. That it's God's will that I handle and take and deal with what's here as best I can in the light of the program, in the light of my own time. Now that may sound so commonplace. Well, of course. But what I notice myself is that when I get God's will and my expectations kind of mixed up, I'll often have the impression that, oh, it all went wrong already. 
So it's no use. It doesn't matter what you do now, you screwed it up. That's never the case. Never, ever, ever. There's always something to do that is in harmony with God's will for us. Always something to do. Another thing, if we start meditating on God's will, that's a dangerous thing to do. Because we can, we tend to crawl into the back of God's head and try to psych him out, figure out what he's, what he's doing. You know, when, uh, somebody we, we love is killed, you know, we, we try to crawl in God's head and figure, what are you up to, God? What, what were you doing? Well, how come you did that? Well, maybe it was because it isn't. We get our, a disease ourselves. We think, well, is this God's will? We try to crawl in God's head and figure out what he is up to. And, and um, if you catch yourself crawling into God's head, crawl out as fast as you can, backward. Get out of there. Um, it leads nothing but trouble. Uh, we're incompetent to get in there. We just come up with the stupidest thing uh, when we're trying to psych out God. Um, that's not what... It's, all, it's always going to say, what God's will for me. Not what God's will in this transcendent order of the universe kind of thing. Because we're incompetent to speak in those terms. And we just get mixed up. Uh, and, and project dumb things onto God. We, we wind up with a big, dumb, cruel God. And can't quite get the harvest in without killing 70 people. Um, uh, yeah. And we we need to what's God's will for me, you know. Anyway. Uh if I'm gonna start to this a little late. I want to say one more thing about God's will, I think. Uh oh I guess I said it. Um One word about formal prayer. Um, formal prayer has um, a bad name. Uh, we're um, kind of think, you know, what's really good is to speak from your heart and have your own prayer, and that is the highest form of prayer. Is simply discovering the identification that God is speaking to you and saying from your heart. Formal prayer has a place in life, however. And it's a matter of, uh, whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer, it's a formal prayer. Um, what that is, is a distillation of the spiritual experience of your mother's father. It's, it's, some, it's the well-worn prayer of people who had a spiritual awakening. And we kind of get in on, the, on an authentic prayer. We read the scripture of your faith. Uh, uh, read some program literature. And when we get in on that prayer, sometimes we are uh, unable altogether to identify with it. And so it, nothing much comes of it. Except the fact that we, but something always comes with prayer, and that if we stop and simply turn towards our higher power to pay attention, and it doesn't work, it works. If we stop and turn towards our higher power, uh, we're not listening to you know what, and we are touched and there's, it's something like the relationship um, of husband and wife, of lovers, of very good friends. Uh, there are all kinds of levels of intensity of communication. From uh, you know a very special moment of just uh, clear love and understanding, or um, down to doing the dishes together, or is having a cup of coffee while both read the newspaper. Um, if you're both having a cup of coffee and reading the newspaper in a friendly, accepting spirit, um, uh, that's nourish. And if you uh, attempt to have a conversation, that doesn't work too well. You didn't get, get it across. But if you were kind of earnestly trying to pay attention to somebody, a friend of yours, and it, well, it didn't go too well, well, you paid it. They know you paid attention to it. And that's part of life. Uh, prayer is just part of life. Regular stuff. Uh, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be intense all the time at all. And most of the time it isn't. Uh, most of the time it's like communication with somebody who's going to get in your life. It's a lot of regular old stuff. Um, but formal prayer, uh, is, um, 
kind of walking along a path with your mothers and fathers. And when you identify a bit, in fact, if you read your, your scripture or, or prayers that are formal, try to have that in mind. That you ask, what's authentic here? What's the good news here? What's, hmm, this, somebody was turned on when they wrote this, and, the, and a million other people identified with it, or it wouldn't be in the book. Uh, hmm, I wonder if I can, I want to see if I can ring my bell and get wrong uh, with this sort of thing. And then be gentle with it. But if it isn't, it isn't. It does better. Uh, but I just want to suggest that as an attitude about both. And now, for the last few minutes here, um, I'd like you to, I'd like you just to have a little meditation. And maybe we could actually, uh, kind of squirm around in your seat and kind of get a little more relaxed. And, uh, uh, we might even try to close our eyes. And, um, And I want to suggest in this meditation to simply walk along a path and consider what our higher power is doing in us. What our higher power has been doing with us this time since we started recovering. And uh, our higher power has been nothing but piling gifts, but he's gotten very deep within us and has changed our taste. We who are alcoholic here have a taste for getting hot. The way of being able to stand. Our higher power has come and has given us a taste for sobriety. And he's building that taste day by day as we identify with other sober alcoholics. And all of us have a taste for achieving security by controlling. The dream of control. And our higher power has gotten very deep within us, so deep that it's in there where our free will is. He, re- he doesn't ch- push us or change us. It's below our awareness. And he's giving us a taste for letting go and granting freedom, he's giving us a taste for trusting the natural process. He's giving us a taste for respecting the freedom and dignity of others. He's giving us a taste for trust. We used to have an ideal of getting everything together right. Uh, and that usually did not include other people being in on what we're doing. It's we're going to do it with them or to them. And our higher power is giving us a taste for fellowship. Giving us a taste for the quality of love and understanding that comes about when we gather together freely and wait upon one another. And wait upon the other to share and we suffer with that person in their struggle to share, and we trust others to let us struggle to share. And it's, a lot of times, we even doubt the whole worthwhileness of it. But we're getting a taste, and it's the taste is going deeper for the kind of fellowship and trust and solidarity that we know now, as we're getting the taste more, uh, is what we need to live. And this new taste of fellowship is obviously a gift that we couldn't get it on our own. And we're getting a taste for loving service. We always liked the idea of loving service, but we spent so much time people-pleasing and being forced to do things and being worried about criticism, and doing so much nervously that we're just exhausted, hurt, and leave me alone. And we're being drawn into a kind of service that does not deplete us, that 
is witnessing to the message freely given. And uh, this, we pass it on uh, knowing we don't own it. And yet our own story is a necessary mixture for it to be understandable. And we're getting a taste for spending some time of being a servant. And it's kind of a surprise that we're, most of us are sick of service. But it's driven by fear. A higher power is nourishing and letting the taste for letting go in sobriety, fellowship, Service. It's like a seed within us, the yeast into the dough, or the mustard seed. It's in us and it's growing. And we're being given a taste for patience rather than faith is growing. We find more trust in God's loving care when we are confronted again with our own. Fears, our own powerlessness over our fears, hang up. And the old ideas return constantly to solve our problems in the old way. And we know that we have a higher power who patiently waits for us to drop the old ways again. To humbly do footwork, always feel like fools. You know that no matter what they're doing, it's not very long to pray a formal prayer together. Or pray the Lord's Prayer. I think we can just say in rows, it's a little too tough to stand up, but if we get all around the circle, we kind of tear the place apart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Back works. Thank you, Father Terry. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.